Hey to everybody here. Thank you for uh, sticking around until the end of the day. I know lots of people are sort of skipping out on the last round of talks to catch planes or trains or flights or buses or whatever else you're uh, getting to. So appreciate you sticking around. Uh, the title of this talk is developing, developing an Expression Language for Quantitative Financial Modeling. So this is uh, about a tool that we've uh, built as Quantopian into an open source library we maintain called Zipline, which is sort of the core of our backtesting engine. Um, the slides for this will be posted afterwards at uh, my GitHub. So it's github.com, S. Sanderson, PyData NYC 2015. There are very old versions of the slides from like four days ago posted right there. So I don't necessarily recommend you follow along, but uh, they'll be posted up there if you want to look at them after, afterwards. Um, so a little bit about me. This is a picture of me wearing a tie. Um, so I'm an engineer at Quantopian. Uh, I work on a whole bunch of things, but one of the hats that I wear is that I'm the lead designer for our APIs. So it's my job to sort of maintain the conceptual integrity of the backtesting platform that we put out. So the core thing that we work on is um, a tool for people to show up and write trading algorithms in the browser in Python. And my primary responsibility is sort of thinking about what abstractions that backtester should, should present to our users, what are the actual like functions, what are they named, what are they called, but more importantly, sort of what are the concepts, the concepts underlying those and how should you think about implementing trading algorithms in our framework. Um, and again, all this stuff is powered by Zipline, which is an open source library under the hood. Um, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at these places. Um, and sort of my background is actually in mathematics and philosophy, but a fair amount of computer science in there as well. So this is going to be a mixed sort of half of this is going to be a very conceptual talk, and half of this is going to be a very like nuts and bolts. This is how we actually made the bits do the thing we wanted them to do. Um, so the outline here, we're going to talk briefly about trading API design. What is a trading algorithm? How should you think about trading algorithms, at least in the framework that we're going to be building here? Um, one of the things that gonna, gonna, that's going to fall out of that is I'm going to argue that symbolic computation is a really powerful idiom for uh, designing high-level APIs that are still performant enough to work on the kinds of data that we want to be working on. Um, I'm going to demo the thing that we've actually built that I'm talking about, um, and then talk about some of the specific technical challenges that come with designing powerful APIs for working on financial data, which has its own fun quirks and idiosyncrasies that make it uh, a particularly challenging domain to work on. Um, so what is a trading algorithm? If you Google for trading algorithm designs, you get a whole bunch of boxes and arrows that I can't imagine mean anything to anyone. Um, so one of the things that I like to think about for any program is every program you've ever written is a function from the current state of the world to side effects, right? So hello world in Python is a function from the contents of your standard in buffer, and it has side effects that writes things into standard out. Um, in the context of a trading algorithm, we have fairly specific world state and fairly specific side effects. So the state that we care about is our current portfolio at any given time, uh, data about the particular assets that we're trading. So that can be things like price and volume data, uh, fundamental value, so earnings, shares outstanding, that sort of thing. Um, and there's sort of this long tail of exotic data that people are trying to incorporate into fundamental or into um, trading algorithms. And then you also have data that's not necessarily meaningfully tied to a particular asset, so things like oil prices and unemployment and the US GDP and that sort of thing. And then our side effects are orders and cancellations, right? So I take in all this data and I decide I now want to own some asset or I now don't want to own some asset, and that's, those are basically our side effects. Um, so one of the things that I like to think about a lot is that good APIs encourage people to decompose problems in a way that's appropriate for the domain. So a good API encourages you to think about concepts the right way in a way that is going to encourage you to you know, have, your, have various pieces of your code have separated concerns, and they're going to be able to allow you to think about different elements of your strategy or different elements of whatever you're doing in a way that you don't have to be constantly sort of thinking about everything at once. You want to be able to break down problems into smaller and smaller pieces until everything you're doing seems simple. Um, and so we have this large problem, right, if we want to look at the state of the world and based on that place orders. Uh, we can, for most trading algorithms, break that down into two pieces. So we're going to say, you know, given the data that we've just seen, what, what positions do we want to hold? Like what's our desired portfolio if we could just wave a magic wand and hold whatever positions we ever wanted to hold? Um, and then the second piece is, okay, given what we want to hold and given what we currently hold, how, do, how are we going to place orders to move us from point A to point B? Um, and the API that I'm going to be talking about today is primarily focused on solving this first problem of how do we take all the different kinds of data that we might care about in a trading algorithm and compute portfolio weights for them. And we can break that problem down even further. So we're going to choose the input data that we're actually going to use to do our computations. Um, we're going to decide what values we actually want to compute. So generally, ultimately, we're going to end up with one number per asset. So somewhere along the way, we're going to take this you know, very multidimensional data, and we're going to be reducing it down to single values. So generally, we're performing uh, numerical reductions, things like mean, you know, moving average, 
uh, exponential moving averages, that sort of thing, or maybe just you know take the last value from some trailing window. Um, often we care about sort of excluding different kinds of assets or different kinds of data, so we're often sort of taking Boolean masks and saying, you know, this data is missing, or I don't want to care about assets that didn't trade over some period of time. Um, and then a third sort of slightly more advanced concept is we often care about sort of bucketing or binning different kinds of data into different groups. So things like I want to group assets by uh, the industry that the company trades in, or I want to partition up the universe of assets by uh, like deciles or quartiles of market cap. Um, so we're going to you know, compute all these different kinds of reductions, produce individual values, and then we want to be able to combine and compare these things. So we take weighted combinations, we do ranking, we do filtering, we do various kinds of normalization. Um, many of these atomic computations, especially from that sort of first top section here, share a common structure where we're going to get the last n periods worth of data, where sometimes n is just one, right? Sometimes you just want the most recent value of some fundamental factor, say. Um, and then we're going to apply a reduction to produce a single valued output for each asset. Um, and there's three sort of core kinds of expression that often get used. So uh, there's, factor is a little bit of an overloaded term in, in the financial domain, but uh, the way that we use it in our system is it, it just means sort of any computation on trailing windows of data that's going to produce a numerically valued result. Um, filters are the same thing, so they're trailing windows that are producing Boolean valued results. And then classifiers are things that are producing categorically valued results. Um, and so sort of one of the interesting things that falls out of that is that we can compose the diff these different kind of computations differently, right? So if I have two computations that produce numbers, well, I can add those together and have a new computation, which is the result of doing the previous two computations and then adding together the results element-wise. Um, and that sort of leads us naturally to thinking about how can we sort of design a language for describing the composition of these different atomic uh, elements. Um, and so sort of going into a little bit more detail on examples, factors are numerically valued things. Common examples are mean, median, first, last, standard deviation. Um, factors can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divide. They can also do some more interesting things. So if I have some factor, which is conceptually a big block of numerical data, I can do things like rank assets. So you know, take moving averages of every asset uh, and you know, rank them by the difference between that and some other moving average. It's like a very classic intro, like hello world for uh, a training algorithm. And you can also do sort of more advanced things like z-scoring or uh, normalization by various kinds of interesting statistical metrics. Um, Filters, again, computations producing Boolean valued results. Most commonly, they're the result of some sort of comparison. So you want to say, you know, I don't care about assets whose volume was below some value, or I don't care about assets where uh, earnings dates were, you know, more than five days before or after now, something like that. Um, and again, we can compose these together by, by, you know, our Boolean operators, you know, and and or. And we can also use them as masks for computations like rank or percentile, where you want to say, rank all assets by some uh, criterion, but ignore assets that didn't meet some other criterion. Um, that's often a very important way to be thinking about these computations. And then classifiers, categoricals, you know, if I have two different ways of bucketing up my universe, I can think about the cross product of those where I have all the values that were bucketed in by one scheme and then another scheme, and I can sort of multiply those out into a matrix. Um, and then most commonly, these are useful for grouping by in order to do normalization. So I can do things like, you know, compute uh, adjusted earnings for all these assets and then subtract out the mean of each uh, asset's sector, say, or its industry. Um, and that's a way of making sure that when you're doing comparisons, you're doing comparisons between companies that are in some sense similar. Um, and so we have these sort of three ideas of different kinds of computations that we're going to do. And we can use that to think about the sort of platonic ideal of an algorithm that we might want to design an API for. And so uh, the algorithms that we're going to sort of be targeting and enabling are algorithms which are going to look at you know, every asset in some large known universe, looking, look at trailing windows of data, compute these filters, factors, and classifiers, uh, and then we're going to compose meta expressions out of those, and then use, ultimately use the outputs from those meta expressions um, to compute desired uh, portfolio allocations, and then not really worrying about this here, but ultimately any algorithm that's doing this would then be taking those and deciding how to actually distribute its capital to the particular assets that they care about. Um, and some sort of high-level design goals. These are just sort of general designs for any kind of uh, API, I think. But so you want to make it easy to share and reuse things that you use in multiple places. You want to make it easy to compose transformations in ways that would seem natural for what they're doing. Uh, you want to be performant enough that you can actually operate on all this data without you know, being unpleasant to use or having to like, you know, scale up a giant cluster in order to do a simple backtest. Um, and you want to be abstract enough that the underlying machinery can be changed without breaking lots of APIs. This is a particularly important thing for us at Quantopian because we take other people's code and like run their trading algorithms with it. And so if we break APIs, then that can potentially, we either have to stop people's algorithms or 
you know, move them to a different server that's using an old, old infrastructure, or something like that. So it's, it's hard for us to safely change the behavior of code out from under people. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we design things that are abstract enough that we can change them without breaking them. Um, and so given all those different sort of design goals, I'm going to argue that uh, symbolic computation is the right way to think about this problem. And I think increasingly what we're seeing in the PyData community especially is that symbolic computation is how high-level APIs to performant code are going to be written. Uh, and I think there's sort of a bunch of reasons why symbolic computation is a really powerful idiom. Um, and by symbolic computation or deferred computation, what I mean are frameworks where you're not operating directly on your data, right? So in NumPy, I build up a NumPy array and I just have a thing that's basically just a buffer of data. And anything that I do with it has to sort of respect the semantics of Python. So if I have an array and I do array plus array plus array plus array, Python dictates that that has to be strict. And so it has to be creating an array and then throwing it away and then creating an array and throwing it away because it has this sort of chain of how it does the binary operators and it's constantly creating and throwing away temporary arrays. Um, and so even in the last two or three years, we've seen this sort of explosion of libraries that are trying to do symbolic computation. So we have Dask, we have Blaze, Ibis, Theano. Just two days ago, Google announced TensorFlow as another library that is very similar to all these things. So all these libraries are built on this idea that you don't operate directly on data. What you operate on are symbolic or abstract representations of data, and then you give that to some execution context and let that execute your code. Uh, and there's a bunch of benefits that come from that kind of a framework, right? So uh, there's optimizations that we can only do when we have sort of a view of the whole computation. If we're doing everything eagerly as soon as we do an expression, then we don't ever get to see the whole computation in its entirety. And so we can't do things like eliminate common sub-expressions or cache or pre-compute pure functions or do certain kinds of term rewritings, right? So if, I, if I'm doing some sort of computer algebra system and I do A plus A plus A, well, modulo like floating point weirdness, I can maybe rewrite that as three times A and that's potentially going to be faster. Um, there's also benefits to abstraction, right? So the framework can change, you know, if, if the framework's API is I just give you some symbolic computation and then say run it, I don't really care how that happens under the hood as long as it gives me the right result at the end. And so it gives language designers a lot more freedom to change how things work under the hood as long as they preserve the output semantics. Um, and this leads to frameworks that can support multiple execution styles or multiple execution contexts, right? So Blaze, for example, is a library that can take these abstract expressions and say, execute this expression against SQL, or execute this expression against NumPy, or execute this expression against you know, some data set that you've never heard of. Um, and Dask is another example of this, where I can take you know, this abstract representation of computation, but then say, run it single-threaded, run it multi-threaded, run it multi-process, or even run it multi-machine, right? So the benefit of being able to separate the description of a computation from the execution of a computation is we can mix and match those when they meet, our, when they meet the thing we're trying to do. Um, and often, symbolic computations also have benefits for correctness. So they tend to encourage working with immutable data structures, which has lots of nice properties. Um, and type systems also give us a lot of the same uh, benefits that traditional compilers do, right? So if I'm going to do some long computation that's going to run on a server and go for five hours, and then the last thing it does is try to add a string to a number and it fails, it's really annoying if you get all the way through those five hours and then find out that you had a bug. And if you have some sort of compile step between there, then you can learn, oh, the last thing I'm going to do is going to barf, and I can catch that before I actually wait the five hours for it to fail. Um, so keeping all those things in mind, I'm going to tab over to a demo of uh, one way that I think you might think about building this kind of expression language um, in Python. So I believe that's already been executed, but I'm going to run it again to be safe. Um, so this is, like I said, sort of the, the simplest hello world example for uh, trading algorithm, so it's doing a dual moving average, and the idea is I'm going to, for every asset in my universe, I'm going to take a 30-day moving average, a 90-day moving average, and then I'm going to screen out assets where the 90-day moving average is shorter, or is lower than the 30-day moving average. And the intuition here maybe is that assets with short, with higher short averages are on the way up in some sense. It's probably not really a reasonable actual trading strategy, but it's a, it's a simple one for a demo. Um, can everybody read okay at this font size? Um, and so the way this works, right, we have these built-in factor objects. Um, I construct a simple moving average object whose inputs are US equity pricing dot close. This is also, again, symbolic. There's no data associated with this. It's just sort of an abstract object that is going to get fed into the system that knows how to actually load this data. And then I'm going to say, I've got a window length of 30, a window length of 90. And then I can use Python operator overloading to do things like construct a filter, which is the result of a Boolean comparison between all these results, right? So I can say, my 30-day moving average greater than my 90-day moving average is my screen. And then I construct a pipeline object that actually represents 
uh, all the computations that I want to do. And again, if I execute this, you know, that happens basically instantly. No computation has happened at this point. I've just sort of built up objects that know how to compute themselves. Um, under the hood, what this is going to do is take all these and build a directed, directed acyclic graph that represents the dependencies between all my different computations. Um, and I can actually visualize what that graph looks like. So if I say so, show graph on this, it's going to spit out a nice pretty visualization where it says, okay, well, get the, get the closed prices for all the assets, construct 30-90 30, 30, day moving averages, feed that into an expression that's going to do a Boolean compare, and then everything in this bottom box ends up being an output. And our, our expression is an output because we've specified that as a screen, which says throw away any assets that don't meet this criteria before you actually show them to me. Um, and then I can take all of that and pass this off to an engine, which says run, and it's going to churn through all of that and spit out about 600,000 rows. And what, what, I, what, end up, what I end up getting back here is a hierarchically indexed data frame. So for every day, I'm going to run this computation, and then I'm going to get an index of equity objects, which are basically thin wrappers around integer with some metadata tied to them. And then I get a column back for every one of these computations that I registered. So I've got my 30-day moving average and my 90-day moving average. Um, so we can sort of scale this up and make it more complex. So I can swap out my simple moving average with a VWAP, which now requires two different inputs. So VWAP is volume weighted average price. Um, and then I can say, well, I can compute the percent change of VWAP between my 30 and 90 days. And it looks just like the numerical code that you want to write here, right? So I've got VWAP 30 minus VWAP 90 over VWAP 30. Um, and I can do things like take the rank of all assets by the percent change in VWAP, where I say ascending equals true or ascending equals false. And I can also do things like take the top 20 assets by VWAP percent change. And again, the, the results of this all end up looking exactly the same. Uh, my graph is a little more complicated now, so I've got sort of arrows going all over the place. Um, one of the interesting things you'll notice is that those complex arithmetic expressions um, actually get fused together. So I don't have an individual node for every like binary operator happening there. The linear chains of, uh, of, of expressions get fused into one single thing and they get computed with a library called numexpr that is designed to look at basically numpy array expressions and optimize away temporaries and do some other fancy things. Um, and so you know I've got my view up, they're getting thrown into this expression, I'm taking a rank, comparing that to 200. This is, these two nodes actually correspond to that top call that I had made. And then I'm also just getting the output here. Um, and again, if I take that and do run pipeline, it takes slightly longer, but not too much longer. Um, and I get my rank back out as well as my percent change. Um, one of the really important ideas that happens here too is that users should be able to ex extend the system with primitives that behave exactly the same way as the built-ins. Um, there's, there's a great talk by Guy Steele called Growing a Language, where the central thesis of that is that one of the really valuable uh, elements of programming languages, or a really important element of programming languages, is the ability for users to add and extend the language in ways that behave exactly like the built-ins of the language. And so you can create your own custom factors, and basically the kernel of this is, this a, is a compute function that gets past the current day, uh, an array of asset labels, an output array, and then an array of uh, a NumPy array corresponding to the data that you actually got passed in. Um, so here I'm writing a custom factor that computes max drawdown, which is just saying, look over the last n days and give me the percent change from peak to trough uh, for each asset there. And so I'm going to construct a 90-day max drawdown. Uh, and then once I've constructed this object, it has all those same built-ins that we looked at before. So I can do ranking on that. Um, I can also pass it. I talked a little bit about um, this notion of uh, masking out things when you do a rank computation. So this says uh, compute VWAP percent change, uh, or rank by VWAP percent change, but mac mask down to just assets that are in the bottom 200 um, by max drawdown. And if I run that, again, I get a slightly more complica complicated graph. Um, and we'll notice here too, right, that this Boolean, or sorry, that this rank now has a, now has a dependency on this top 200 call, which is saying that in order to successfully compute rank with this masking applied to it, I have to have first figured out how to, which assets I actually want to mask out in that ranking operation. And again, I can do run pipeline, and I get all my values. And note that all the ranks are between 0 and 200, because I only masked down to just those values. Um, so that's sort of the basic API of how it works. So, Basically, you know, we can see that when I define these custom factors, they're all just getting past you know, trailing windows of NumPy arrays. Um, and so really all that we need to do now to make all this work is say, well, how do we just get reasonable arrays of data into all these computations? Um, the subtitle of this is how hard can it be to get the last 30 days of price? And it turns out it's harder than you might think, unfortunately. Um, so there's a couple things about financial data specifically that make it 
um, more complex to work with than you might otherwise enjoy. So companies are constantly being created and destroyed. So if we want to naively just represent all this data as like a big assets by dates array, uh, it's a little bit tricky because we either have to have lots of missing data or we have to somehow chunk that up into pieces that uh, aren't wasting most of that space. Uh, splits, dividends, and mergers render past and current prices and volumes incomparable. Uh, and restatements are particularly th thorny to do in any kind of array-oriented way. Um, so like I said, assets are constantly being created and destroyed. This is just a table of all the assets in our asset database. There's about 200, or about 20,000 of them. These are just US equities, so it's not that big in the scheme of like total financial data. And looking at, did we think it existed on a particular day? Um, and if we graph that, we can see you know, they're sort of going up and down and up and down, and 2008 wasn't a great year. Um, keep going. So splits, dividends, and mergers are another fun problem. So this is just some code that's reading in uh, the price of Apple in 2014 and plotting it. Uh, and we, you know, very naively, if we looked at this data, we'd be like, oh my god, Apple tanked in the middle of 2014. Um, and of course, in reality, what happens is that Apple had a seven to one split in the middle of 2014. So everyone who held one share of Apple suddenly held seven shares, and they were all worth seven times as less. So nobody's, the amount of value that everyone held didn't change, but suddenly the price had this very big change to it. Um, that you know, is very obvious if you look at the graph, right? Everything suddenly just tanked by a factor of enough that you're gonna notice. Uh, more subtle here is Apple also paid a $3 dividend in the middle of May. And that, if you just look at the graph, isn't that obvious, but that should also be affecting things like return calculations because you know, between, this is actually the X date of the dividend, not the, the pay date, but at that point in time, a share of Apple actually just became worth $3 left because up until that, or $3 less, because up until that point, every share of Apple came with a promise of a free $3 at some point in the future. And so when you hit the X date of a dividend, you should expect the price of an asset to tick down slightly to the value of that dividend. And that's essentially the same problem as a split except on a much larger magnitude. Um, and if you're just trying to naively calculate returns, say, you know, you know, you do a one day returns as a percent change, you're gonna get all these strange anomalies in your data. And this gets more and more pronounced as you look over long time horizons, right? So if I tried to do like a 30 day, you know, backward looking returns, I'd have this big long window of it like slowly getting back to the right location. Um, restatements are another fun problem. So uh, here's a hypothetical scenario. On March 5th, Apple announces that its quarter one revenue was $15. That looks a little suspicious to us, but we're like, ah, man, maybe they had an off, off quarter. Um, and then on March 15th, Apple issues an amendment to say, oh, our quarter one revenue was actually $15 billion. Um, and now our user asks us, what was Apple's quarter one revenue? What's the right value for us to return here? And the answer is it depends, right? And if we're in a simulation on March 4th, the right answer is I don't know because we didn't have that data available to us. On March 16th, the right answer, as far as we knew, is $15. And it's up to the user to decide that that's probably not a value that they want to use. Um, and then on March 16th, the right answer is the value that we actually knew. Um, and so all of these things are bringing us to this question of how do we make sense of data whose value we want to be sort of thinking about differently from different reference frames. Uh, and one way to think about it is that you actually have this notion of like perspectival data, right? Where data whose value depends on when you're asking the question. Um, so the traditional solution to a lot of these problems is to use what, what's called adjusted prices. Um, and generally what this means is sort of mucking with historical prices so that they're comparable to current prices. And this is what you get if you query like you, Yahoo or Google Finance APIs. Um, so there's some problems with adjusted prices though. So one problem is that they're non-reproducible in the sense that if I take the values that Yahoo quoted me in 2014 and run a back test through 2012, and then I take the same values that Yahoo, or I take the values that Yahoo quotes me today for 2012, I'm gonna have different numbers piping through my algorithm. And if you've written your algorithm in a sane way, you probably shouldn't be making different trading decisions about those, but it's still this problem of reproducibility where if some, something suddenly starts behaving differently, then you're not running it with the same numbers and it's not obvious that you know, those things aren't aren't affecting it. Um, it can also introduce some sort of subtle biases. So if an algo has access to the real, the real price and the adjusted price, then it can tell that a dividend or split is coming. Um, and stocks that have undergone multiple splits in the past will actually, or you know, between the point we're asking about and now, will have very low prices in the past because they're being multiplied artificially over and over. Um, and it still doesn't help us with restatements, right? Even you, you can actually get around some of these problems by like adjusting to some fixed point in the past, and then the prices that you see for now aren't meaningfully related or are very different from the prices actually now. But you still can't handle this problem of restatements, right? Where 
faithfully representing restated values sort of irreducibly requires that I tell you a different value for something at different points in time. Um, so we have this problem, right? We're trying to reduce down this data to a single data point for a given point in time, and that abstraction is broken for us in the face of all these issues, right? So we want to be able to say, you know, the value for a data set for a given asset for a given time is blah. Um, we can't do that, but what we can say instead is that the value of a given data set for a given asset at a given time from some perspective has a meaningful value. And this allows us to talk in a meaningful way about how do you correctly calculate something like returns on data that has these adjustment and restatement problem. Um, so, you know, we've looked at, or we've talked about, okay, well, we, maybe we want to have this extra notion of dimensionality. And now the immediately thing we should be nervous about is, well, if we just, you know, blow up the dimensionality of our data set, then we've blown up the size of our data by, you know, however big our biggest look back window is, which can potentially be pretty large. Um, so, sort of some napkin math for the size of the data set that we're looking at. This is all just uh, daily equity data, and sort of the most naive representation of this you could have would be a big array where you have, you know, a value for asset ID, open, high, low, close, volume, and date, um, and then times the number of assets, times the number of dates, and even then it's like, this, there's immediate obvious things you could do, but the, oh, the most naive representation of you, that you could have for this is about four gigabytes. Um, we're going to skip that. Um, I think I forgot to execute a slide up above, but I don't have time to go back for that right now. Um, so we do some slightly fancy tricks. We're using a lot, uh, a, on this data format called bcalls. Um, it's compressed and chunked, um, and that lets us, get, lets us get the data to about 300 megabytes. Um, the main things that we're doing to, to make it smaller like that is we don't store entries for dates where, they didn't, where an asset didn't exist. We represent all the data as 32-bit unsi unsigned ints instead of 64-bit floats. Um, obviously, cutting it in half cuts the size of the data in half. Uh, a little more subtle thing that I thought was cool is that uh, integers, tend to, integers that come from real-world processes tend to compress much better than floats because bit patterns of integers that are near each other tend to be more similar than bit patterns of floats that are near each other because of how floats and integers are actually represented uh, in the standard ways, at least. And so you can often get better compression by representing things as integers rather than floats. Um, and so the question is, OK, well, we don't want to just you know, arbitrarily blow this up to like some three-dimensional array that's ginormous. We want to build some data structure that's in, that encapsulates this complexity. And so one of my like, favorite programming quotes of all time is this uh, quote by Rob Pike, who's now one of the designers behind Go. Uh, and he says, data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, the algorithms will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. Um, and so what we've done to make this problem tractable is we've designed this data structure called an adjusted array. Um, and basically what an adjusted array is just is a little buffer that stores the, the as-traded prices of various things or the as-reported the as values for like fundamental stuff. And then it also keeps around this little dictionary of places to mutate the data when I get to a certain point. So this says, all right, I've got uh, the data. This is the data for Microsoft and Apple through the period that we were just looking at. Um, and it says, okay, well, here's my buffer of data. And then I also have this array of adjustments, which says, when I get to row 13, retroactively change my view of the data, multiplying it by 1 over 7. So this is, this is actually the sort of on the metal representation of how we deal with those splits. Uh, and then I, I can call traverse on this. And this produces a window, a window, like a windowing iterator object that, again, has this buffer of data and then knows that as I tick forward in time, I need to retroactively change my view of what the world looked like. Uh, and so here, right, the splits show up as float64 multiplies. But you could also imagine having overwrite objects for things like restatements. Um, and then if I iterate through this thing, right, you can see the price is sort of slowly ticking, just sliding up the screen here. And what we should expect is that when we get to the ninth, which is when the split occurs, uh, all the values should suddenly tank by a factor of seven so that they're comparable to the prices that we're seeing on the morning of the ninth. Um, but sort of the curve and the shape of those prices should, be, should stay constant. And that's, in fact, what we see here, that suddenly all these Apple values went from being about 600 to being about 90. Um, and then so that's sort of the core data structure that's underlying all this stuff. And when we actually uh, query all this data at the, as the atomic terms of the uh, graph, this is what we're firing out. Um, so there's a bunch of future work that you know, we'd still want to build into this. So I have a branch on my laptop that's adding support for the classifier stuff that I talked about. Um, we also right now only support uh, floating point and sort of Boolean data. Um, 
So support for non-numeric data types, in particular, dates are a really important thing for anything in the financial domain. So you want to be able to say things like you know, assets that have uh, earnings coming up or something like that. Um, and then data sets that have multiple entries per data point or per asset per day. So things like earnings estimates, calendars, the whole long tail of more exotic data, uh, figuring out clean APIs to allow people to reduce that higher dimensional data into data that can work in this framework is sort of an ongoing project that if anyone has deep thoughts on, I would love to pick your brain about. Um, and then longer term, like I talked about, a lot, of, a lot of the benefits of symbolic computation come from being able, to having, being able to have these different execution engines, right? So you could imagine having a parallel version of that algorithm where right now I showed you all those different graphs and basically what the algorithm is, you know, jump through all the entries in the graph and just compute them by themselves. Uh, a more interesting algorithm for that might be something like take all the nodes in that graph, start a thread that says wait until or block until all my dependencies are satisfied and then compute me. Um, and that would allow us to leverage parallelism for a lot of these uh, computations in a way that we're not doing right now. Um, and then maybe further down the road doing something like just-in-time compilations of the factor compute function. So numbers are really obvious thing that we could do there. Um, but also maybe you know, just-in-time compilation for something like Cython uh, would be an interesting avenue to pursue. Um, that's all that I, I have to talk about. But thank you guys for listening. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yep. Uh, just instantiating them doesn't do anything. So they're just objects that know how to compute things. So the actual uh, thing that causes computation to happen is I say, I've got this pipeline object. It has like a simple moving average thing. So I'm saying uh, the columns of my pipeline are going to be uh, a 30-day moving average, which is computed by this 30-day moving average object. Um, and then when I actually say run pipeline on that, the columns that I passed here correspond to the columns of the data frame that gets spat out. How do you bind inputs to the uh, So that's built into the simple moving average object. So I, when I said here inputs equals US equity pricing dot close, so that's just a symbolic object. I skipped over the slides that are actually setting up like the IO machinery there. So basically what happens is you register a loader that knows how to load the US equity pricing dot close column. And on Quantopian, we've built a whole bunch of loaders for things like Morningstar Fundamentals and Psych Signal and Xdemise and all these other sort of exotic data sets. Um, the US equity pricing loader stuff. There's, a, there's one that's built in for Zipline that reads that fancy B calls format that I talked about a little bit. Yep. So can you just inject an array of transforms that somehow express it enough to tell you what exactly the purpose of the computer is exactly? Yeah, so I mean, for the splits, mergers, and dividends cases, they're all just retroactively multiply everything looking back by some value. And then the adjustments get represented as overwrites. The tricky thing is making sure you sequence those correctly because they don't necessarily uh, commute correctly. So you have to know what the semantics are of where the over, where, when and where the overwrite happens. And that responsibility gets delegated to the loader to do correctly. Uh, can you be a little more specific? Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so the way that we represent that stuff generally, this, that stuff is. Um, sort of at a different layer of abstraction from the stuff I'm talking about. From, so by the time it gets to the stuff that I just showed here, that all just gets encoded as these like adjustment objects. But generally speaking, the strategy for that is we have, some, we have this notion of like the baseline and then an adjustment of, and a notion of like deltas to the baseline. So basically we say like, here's when we first learn some value about a particular time period, this is the entry we have for that. And then if we have some amendment to that, that gets represented in a separate table that says here's uh, you know, a, a piece of information that says we should actually change our view of the world once we get to some point in time. So there's amendments that get done in the framework? Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. So they're generally, because you could represent it as just like the best known value at every point in time, but then you're, you're duplicating most of the data, right? Most data doesn't get adjusted most days. Cool. Well, thank you guys all. <laughs>